This video is sponsored by the Kickstarter for the Bloody Bell Boots Boogie. I never grew up playing video games. I got a Game Boy when all the other kids got a Game Boy Color, and I got a Game Boy Color just when everyone else was starting to graduate to other systems. My parents didn't want me playing video games, they said video games rotted your brain. Of course, with hindsight, given my tendency to fixate on whatever new interest comes my way, they may have just thought video games would rot my brain specifically. And in hindsight, I'm kind of glad I didn't develop the expensive habit of video games when I was young. Instead, I developed the expensive habit of reading comic books, a hobby so pricey I literally couldn't afford to keep doing it. And eventually, I developed the habit of playing and running tabletop role-playing games, a hobby you can participate in for free, but there's also no limit to how much you can spend on it. Now, I did get into video games a little bit in 2019 and a bit more in 2020, but I'm still very much a newbie in the video game scene, and there are a ton of games that I would love to sit down and play when I get the time. I've got a long list, and I am always looking for recommendations, so hit me up in the comments if you have some. But every once in a while, one game comes along and makes such an enormous impact that not only does the entire video game hobby take notice, but the game immediately takes on a new role in the broader culture. In in 2023, we got one of those games when Larian Studios released Baldur's Gate 3, and the world went nuts for it. And I've been wanting to play this game for a while, and I finally got the chance to start streaming this game in March. I did a stream to uh, create my character, and then a couple weeks ago, I started playing the game in earnest. And then, literally the day after my first Baldur's Gate livestream, we went to the hospital for a standard appointment just for an NST stress test for the baby, and we wound up in labor for five days before finally having our baby more than a month early. So. Now that I've got a newborn, I don't think I'll have as much time as I'd like to continue streaming, at least for a little while. However, based on what little I got a chance to experience, I was really impressed with what I saw. Specifically, with how they chose to introduce the game. Because they do everything we should do at our own tables when we run a Session Zero for our players. Let's talk about that. If you'd like to see me do more live streams of Baldur's Gate 3, make sure to subscribe. It has absolutely no bearing on how quickly I can get back to live streaming. I want to be perfectly clear, my timeline to start live streaming is entirely dependent on my child's development, uh, how we're able to balance childcare and other activities, and finding a quiet place to stream for a couple of hours with some semi-reliable consistency. You're not in control of any of that, it'll happen in its own time. But it would still be a huge help to me if you can subscribe. This video contains spoilers for only the opening cinematic of the game. I've played a little bit further than that, but not very much, so please don't spoil anything in the comments. Although, you know, if I'm reading comments this month, that's kind of on me. I've got other things I need to be doing instead. So, you, you know, just flag your spoilers in the comments. This video also contains game footage that includes a scene of body horror and gross eyeball stuff. I'll give you a heads up before we get there. The game opens with a cinematic that establishes the situation the players will find themselves in when they begin the game. And in a way, I think this kind of simulates the act of pitching your game to your players. As far as I'm concerned, there are three ways most D&D groups decide on the adventure they're going to play through for any given campaign. The first, and I suspect the most common, is for a GM to give their players basically no information. They'll just run the game they want to run, and their players will make their characters with no idea of what campaign they're being created for. I don't think this is usually a conscious choice. I genuinely just think it doesn't occur to most GMs to talk it through with their players. They have an adventure they want to run for their group, so that's what they prep. The second option is to ask your players what they want to play. Maybe you pitch them a few different campaign ideas, or maybe you just ask them, Hey, what sort of adventure would you all be interested in? There's not really a wrong way to do this, just as long as you are open to the ideas your players have. But the third option is to decide what campaign you're running, and then ask around to see which of your friends would like to play in that campaign. Now, this is inherently kind of a privileged option, because in order for this to work, you have to be able to have a lot of different potential players to invite. But if that's the situation you're in, then this can be a really wonderful option, because it means anyone who joins the game has already signed on for the game you want to run. Now, you should still be somewhat flexible to accommodate your players. For example, when I recruited folks to play in my Curse of Strahd campaign, one player asked that there not be any themes of self-harm in the game, because that made that player uncomfortable. There are themes of self-harm in Curse of Strahd as written, but they can be adjusted or removed in order to make that player feel more comfortable. However, another potential player said, I don't like it when kids are in lethal jeopardy. And I told them, listen, I will happily run games where kids are not in that sort of danger, but the premise of this adventure that I want to run is that you're all kids from our world. The game I'm running is about kids being in lethal jeopardy. So if that's a non-starter for you, then that's not a problem. We'll just find another game to play together. It's 
just not going to be this campaign. In this case, there are certainly themes in Baldur's Gate 3 that could be removed if they had to be, but there's also some aspects of body horror that are central to the plot. The Mind Flayers put a creature inside the player character's brains, and as Matt Colville discussed in his video about the game, those worms are vital to the story. However, the way it's presented to the audience is paired with some eye trauma, and that is optional. The body horror could just as easily involve the ear or nose or throat instead. I, I didn't mean to do that. But in all seriousness, if we look at other fiction where mind-controlling critters enter the brain, the Yerks from Animorph enter through the ear, and the Goa Old from Stargate SG-1 enter through the back of the neck or through the mouth. I have a friend who does not like eye stuff in in D&D games, not actually in any sort of fiction, so if I ran this game for them, I would just adjust the body horror to not include eye trauma. So, okay, let's assume you've recruited the players who want to play in this game. Now they sit down and they're ready to create characters. And for sure, you could totally do that. But Baldur's Gate 3 doesn't actually start with character creation, which it totally could. And it also doesn't wait until the opening cinematic is done, and then you go create your character and jump into gameplay. Instead, it literally splits the opening cutscene in the middle. The first part of the cutscene introduces only the bare minimum the players need to know before creating their characters. Namely, the basics of the campaign. So let's recap the first half of the intro cinematic. We see the inside of a Mind Flayer ship, which is purely alien in design. Yet there is a mural of a Mind Flayer being worshipped by humanoids, so we know at least a little bit about these enemies. They're megalomaniacal conquerors of some sort. There are also pods around the room. A green-skinned woman with no nose is in one of the pods. A Githyanki woman. And our character is in another pod, and we sometimes get to experience the scene from that perspective. A Mind Flayer floats into the room, and with a gesture, opens a pod of water. Or some sort of fluid. It grabs a little worm creature and floats over to the Githyanki woman. Content warning for body horror and eye stuff here, just jump a moment ahead to this time code to skip it. But the Mind Flayer puts this worm on the Githyanki woman's face and it crawls into her eye socket, squeezing past her eye and worming into her brain. Then the Mind Flayer grabs another worm and floats toward your character. And in a detail I love, your character tries to look away, to keep your face away from the worm. But the Mind Flayer reaches out a hand and takes control of your body and your mind, making you face forward and keep your eyes open. And then the worm approaches you and presumably does the same thing to you, and we cut to black. This whole scene is designed to introduce the Mind Flayer to an audience who knows nothing about them. And outside of the most notable feature of Mind Flayers, the fact that they literally eat brains, we get a lot of other important information about the Mind Flayers in this scene. We see that they're psychic, they control their ships telepathically, and they implant tadpoles into unwilling hosts for some nefarious reason. Sure, that's cool lore from D&D, but it's also only the stuff that is absolutely essential to know to understand the beginning of the game. For example, the fact that they psychically control the ship is important to foreshadow, so that when your character goes on to potentially exert some control over the ship once they actually start playing, you know that you're borrowing powers from the tadpole in your mind. And the question of how much power you borrow from the tadpole seems to be a pretty major dramatic question in the game, from what I understand. This is the stuff that would absolutely be in the pitch you give to your players, because they need to know that they'll be playing as characters with psychic worms in their heads. That's kind of the whole gimmick. It's also very useful to know that they're opening the game trapped on an alien ship, because that will impact what characters your players are going to want to make. However, usually I would say, Okay, you have the campaign pitch, we'll get together for a session zero and build our characters together, and then start the game with all of you together on the ship, trapped in your pods, and then something is going to happen to free you and start the adventure. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But honestly, this opening cinematic kind of makes me want to start a game by opening with just this kind of dramatic intro. After all, the players can't make any meaningful choices until something actually frees them from the Mind Flayer pods. And if you start the game with character creation, and then introduce the scene where the Mind Flayers implant their worms into the PC's brains, some of those player characters will do whatever they can to try to resist it, even though the players know there is no way to resist this because it's the opening hook for the campaign. And even though the players know that, Feeling that they can't make choices might genuinely make them feel like, oh, well, this intro is on rails, that's a bummer. And yeah, this intro is on rails, because it leads into the adventure the players agreed to play. So maybe instead you follow the lead of this game. Maybe you run them through this bare bones opening cinematic, and then you create your characters together. Once you've already established that the implantation has definitely happened and isn't just a future plot point that your players have in the back of their minds, no pun intended, then this may actually impact the way they build their characters. They'll be more likely to make a character who is going to have some sort of dramatic interaction with the core question of the brainworms in their heads, rather than all of them just sticking with the character they already wanted to make. We also don't start earlier and see how each of these player characters got abducted, which is yet another opportunity for the player characters to try to resist, and when they can't do that, they might feel especially railroaded. Here's a handy rule of thumb. If the players can't do anything to avoid a plot beat happening, then don't present it as a scene the players can play through. 
just use a cutscene. And I haven't done this before, but I have a guess that presenting a cutscene at the beginning of the game will go down even smoother at a D&D table when your players don't actually have a character built yet. They can't use any of their cool powers to solve the brain worm problem because the brain worm problem is not solvable at this point in the adventure. I also want to take a moment and appreciate just how weird this adventure is. This is something we'll talk about in another episode, but most introductions to low-level D&D focuses on the more traditional adventure format. Some goblins or kobolds are up to no good, you should go see what they're up to, which usually takes you into a dungeon. Maybe you'll wind up finding a dragon wormling, so you can get both a dungeon and a dragon. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. It works for a reason. And goblins are great introductory monsters for new players because basically everybody knows what goblins are. But this setup involves psychic squid men from space putting mutant worms into your brains, and the other prisoner we see is from a culture of dimension-hopping, dragon-riding psychic zealots. And I think there's a virtue in letting D&D adventures be openly weird and a little bit horrifying. Which is why I'm so glad this video is sponsored by the upcoming Kickstarter for the Bloody Bell Boots Boogie. The Bloody Bell Boots Boogie is a new adventure for 5e and the OSR and Quest, created by Watcher DM. Their whole approach is turning fantasy on its head and leaning into the weirdness. Their art and adventure design is so unique and cool. It reminds me of Epic Spell Wars or Adult Swim cartoons mixed with tarot cards. It's really cool. And they think a lot about what GMs need to run these adventures. For example, in their previous quest adventure, Tomb of the Vampire General, they have a section called Hurry Up Events, which are things you can do to help keep the party from spinning their wheels and falling into analysis paralysis, which shows me that they actually really understand the exact sort of issues my players get hung up on. I'd imagine you might feel the same way. Their new adventure, the Bloody Bill Boots Boogie, features a band of red caps causing havoc and your players have to get to the bottom of it. The book also comes with a fey creature generator, so you can use random charts to create your own unique and bizarre Archfey. They've also got some really cool stretch goals like a booklet about the city of Arcanos, additional maps in the adventure, additional magic items, and the Fey Hunter character option, which would be a subclass in 5e, a role in Quest, and a class in the OSR. The Kickstarter launches today, so make sure to check it out at the link in the description and support a really cool product from an independent publisher who just wants to keep tabletop RPGs nice and weird. Thank you so much to Watcher DM, the creators of the Bloody Bell Boots Boogie, for sponsoring this video. Now let's return to the Mind Flayers and the body horror. After the Mind Flayer puts the worm into the player character's brain, the game takes you to the character creation menu. Again, I think this is a valuable part of any Session Zero, working together to create compatible characters. In this case, I think it's really useful for the players to know the tone of the game before they create characters. And so I would imagine an opening cinematic in your tabletop game could accomplish that task really well. Baldur's Gate 3 walks you through character creation and gives you the chance to create a companion character as well. I have no idea what that means, it hasn't come up yet as I've played the game, but in a weird way, it kind of simulates the experience of creating characters together at the table. There are also pre-generated characters available to choose, and while not all published adventures include pre-generated characters, and certainly your home game probably doesn't, this does represent something else that's really achievable and useful creating characters who are tied into the main plot. I don't know very much about Baldur's Gate 3, but from what I do know, I believe a lot of the companions in the game have plot connections that tie them into the main storyline, and you can choose to play as one of them. They're called origin characters. And while we might not always be able to give our players pre-generated characters for our campaigns, we can give them more information about where the campaign is going so they can make choices to better connect them into the story. For example, in Tyranny of Dragons, there were some character options at the back of the book that players could take that would better connect them to the plot points and themes of the adventure. Alternately, you can just make sure the backstories of your PCs are integrated into the main arc of the campaign. I've made a video about that before, and that is a great way to make your player characters feel like the main characters of the campaign. The scenario we see in Baldur's Gate 3 also offers a fantastic excuse for your players to play any character ancestry or class. You know how there are all these weird ancestries in D&D and some GMs are like, well, okay, how did this menagerie of colorful characters all wind up in the same tavern at the same time, just in time for some major inciting incident that sets the campaign into motion? So, because it seems so unreasonable for the only four monstrous adventurers in the Deseran Valley to all be in Red Larch on the same day, and all be in the same spot at the same time for the adventure to begin, well, some GMs limit the number of weird creatures the players can play in their games. But in this scenario, the Mind Flayers could have picked up their hostages from literally anywhere across the D&D multiverse, so your characters can play any type of ancestry. Someone might even hear you describe the Githyanki prisoner in the opening cutscene and say, hey, can I play her? That character sounds awesome. And that would totally work. 
I mean, you literally could do that in the game. Lazel is an origin character. This scenario also takes a lot of heavy lifting off of the players. They don't have to try to figure out how their characters know each other, why they would trust each other. That's all provided by the circumstances. Sure, maybe a couple of your players can say, yeah, we know each other. Our characters are siblings or friends and they were captured together or something like that. But they don't have to do that because the introduction gives them an excuse to be strangers with an incentive to work with each other because they've been thrust into a dire scenario together. Of course, at this point, the players might begin to try to figure out how they can break out of their imprisonment, so it's probably wise to jump right into the inciting incident, which is exactly what the next half of the cutscene does. And I just want to walk through this cinematic and talk about some of the things I think it does especially well. First of all, we follow the Mind Flayer through the tunnel, which means we're not limiting ourselves just to what the player characters are experiencing. Now, you might not use cutaways like this in your D&D games, but something like this is the perfect opportunity to give them a try. It's a short scene, so your players don't have to wait too long before they get to make choices of their own, but it's still a fun sequence that can give your players a sense of what situation they're walking into. Their characters would be super confused once the scene is over, but by showing your players what has happened, even though their characters don't really have all the information, it will still allow the players to focus their characters' actions on the important details, to basically metagame in a good way. Anyway, we watch the Mind Flayer control the ship with his mind. That's useful exposition that'll be relevant when the actual adventure begins. And then the Mind Flayer ship, the Nautiloid, descends from the skies over a sprawling medieval city. Again, the Mind Flayer commands the Nautiloid's tentacles with his mind, and the Nautiloid smashes a tower. Not really for any reason. I mean, maybe he's trying to stop the alarm bell from being rung, but I feel like the falling tower will still cause quite the commotion. But Whatever, it happens because it's cool. And then the ship's tentacles come down and start zapping civilians, and it turns out one touch transports you into one of the Nautiloid's cages, and knocks you out, which explains why nobody has broken out so far. Then a portal opens up and three dragons fly out of it, with more Githyanki warriors riding on their backs. The dragons attack the ship and the Mind Flayer retaliates, but one of the dragons is able to bite through the side of the Nautiloid. And we learn here that the ship is organic. It's made of skin and living tissue. The Mind Flayer connects two tentacles and then strums them like a guitar string and teleports the ship to somewhere else in the D&D multiverse to try to escape the dragons. This is vital exposition for the players to learn because getting to the helm and using that device is going to be the goal of their first quest, so they can escape to safety. The ship appears in a wintry forest, but a portal opens and the dragons chase the Nautiloid. So we know now that these dragons aren't just guardians of the city, they are hunting the ship specifically. The Nautiloid tries to lose them in a canyon, but one of the dragons is able to breathe fire into the same chamber from earlier, and it turns out that whatever fluid the worms are swimming in is just like extremely flammable. An explosion rips through the ship and it accidentally teleports again. Then we cut back to the perspective of the player characters who were trapped in the ship. One of them gets free and looks out of the gaping hole in the side of the ship and sees that this ship is now flying through hell. They see three jagged obelisks floating in the air, and I genuinely thought they were going to be part of the logo for Baldur's Gate 3. They look like the Roman numeral in the logo, but apparently they are diegetic. They're towers or forts, or maybe they're those floating dark elf ships from Thor the Dark World. But regardless, a bunch of devils fly out of them and start racing toward the Nautiloid. And now the players understand the situation their characters are going to find themselves in when the adventure actually begins in earnest. They are trying to escape from a Mind Flayer ship that is flying through hell, which is currently being swarmed by devils and menaced by dragons. And even if they can get somewhere safe, they've each got a psychic worm in their brains. That is a hell of an opening. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into how we can take a scenario like this and drop it into our own games. There is a bunch more to talk about with this game, even just in the early moments that I've experienced. I didn't talk about how the logo shows a warrior transforming into a mind flayer, which seems to be the dramatic tension of the game, the risk that your character will transform into psychic monsters. In truth, I would love to keep making videos about the lessons we could learn from Baldur's Gate 3 and apply to our own D&D games. It can be formatted a bit like the Critical Role Demystified videos, where I go through the story in sections and break down the lessons we can learn. And I've already got a few ideas for videos just based on the little bit of the game I've played so far. But Part of what makes Critical Role Demystified work is that I've seen the entire campaign, so I have the benefit of hindsight. I know which elements Matt was deliberately foreshadowing, and I can probably guess which ones he had to come up with on the fly. So if I really was going to do a Baldur's Gate 3 Demystified series, I'd want to play through the whole game first. And I just don't know yet when I'll have the time to do that. Like, just for context, uh, right now I'm filming this video the day before it has to go out, and it is almost 6 in the morning. My schedule is 
completely whack right now. Like I said earlier, I would love to start live streaming again in the next couple of months, uh, but if you want to see more videos like this, uh, let me know in the comments below. Think of this like a pilot for a future Baldur's Gate 3 Demystified series, and let me know if that sounds interesting to you. In the meantime, if you want to support the channel, make sure you are subscribed and ring the bell. That's how we appease the psychic alien parasite we know only as the YouTube algorithm. Support me on Patreon or become a YouTube member to help me pay for food and diapers. Join my Discord server to hang out with other awesome people, and join my newsletter to stay up to date with all of my latest news when I get the energy to actually send out an update. We talked a lot about character creation in this video, so check out my latest character creation video. It's about using multi-classing as your starting point for character inspiration. Until next time, play fair and have fun.